excited again to be here to share this uh, presentation with, uh, with you this evening. Tonight, we are going to be looking at um, Jesus and the dead man or the resurrection and the life and death. Okay, so before we begin tonight, I'd like to uh, just uh, welcome each and every one of you that's joining us. Um, thank you for being with us here in person, as well as those who are joining us online. Um, I'm going to ask that you would pray for the baptism candidates because um, I got word today from Michael Gill and his wife, Ramonia, that she injured her back uh, pretty badly. And um, this husband and wife, they want to get baptized together. And I certainly understand that. So um, if, she, if she is well enough tomorrow evening, they will be here for baptism. But if not, we'll reschedule. That's no problem, right? And um, so I just want to ask that you would pray for them, that you would pray for Jorge, who um, is sick. And um, we're praying for healing in Jesus' name over him and then over Matthew as well um, as he, uh, you know, is getting ready for uh, baptism. So um, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. I'll add my prayer to that of pastor, and we'll jump right into the message for this evening. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Jesus and Holy Spirit, thank you so much for blessing us again throughout this Sabbath. And what, what, a, what a wonderful wonderful experience we again, we again have had with you. Um, it's a joy. It's a joy to be in your presence and to worship and to praise you and to study your word together. So Holy Spirit, take over. Uh, this is your meeting. You've gathered us together here tonight, and I pray that you will speak to our hearts, that you would give us what we need tonight that Jesus will be lifted up, that he will be front and center, that he will be the focus, the emphasis, the draw, the center of attention, that he will be the star. Um, and, and Father, I just pray that every blessing that you intend for us to have and receive this evening through your word, may we receive it with gladness and with joy. Bless your people. Please be with Michael and Ramonia. Um, she injured her back. Be with George, who is who is ill, um, be with Matthew, be with Marty and Tess, who are out of town. And, uh, but, Father, we're going, to, we're going to go according to your time. Amen. The devil is a liar, and he has no authority in this, in this space because you occupy this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 I'd like to, um, for those who, are, who have their Bibles and... Uh, all your devices, please go with me to the book of Isaiah, real quickly, chapter 40. Isaiah, chapter 40. Now, I'd like to just uh, go over something here. In Isaiah, chapter 40, it speaks to us about the mission of Christ. It is a, it is a prophecy regarding the mission of Jesus and what he would do um, when he comes to this earth. And actually, this is the mission of John the Baptist. And, um, but I want you to notice what it says, because in, verse, in chapter 35, we, look at the, we see the mission of Jesus. But in verse, notice what it says here, beginning in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked, the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And verse 5, and the what, everybody? And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Okay? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. I'm not going to ask you to turn to it, but we know that we can reference also the book of Exodus chapter 33 where Moses prayed and asked God to reveal his glory. Well, we know that God actually when he revealed his glory, it was his attributes. It was his characteristics. It was his character that was revealed. I'd like to also invite you to go with me to the Gospel of John. Go with me to the Gospel of John chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, and please notice what it says there in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And um, 
I'm going to actually, as you're going there, let me read this out of um, Isaiah chapter 35 because I'm already, I'm still in Isaiah, but you guys can go to John chapter 1. Notice here what it says in regards to the ministry of Jesus in Isaiah 35, beginning of verse 1. It says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice. The blossom and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. What is it that they're going to see? The glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Notice verse 3, And strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf, deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. <laughs> and the parched ground shall become a pool in the thirsty land, springs of water, in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with, with reeds and rushes. I want you to notice what it says in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And notice what it says there. In Isaiah, we see that the glory of the Lord will be seen. It's mentioned in, in, in future tense that it will be seen. But just like we did the other night, notice what it says in John chapter 1 and verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14. Notice what John writes here. John says, and the word was made what, everybody? Was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his what? His glory, the glory as, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so what we have here is that while in Isaiah, it's a future tense of the word glory and how the glory of God will be seen. And here in John chapter 1 verse 14, John says that we have beheld his glory. We have seen and witnessed his glory. We were there with, this, with him, God in the flesh. The Logos becoming flesh and dwelling among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Would you say amen? amen. I want you to notice, go with me one more time to um, the gospel, um, here the gospel of John and chapter 17. John chapter 17. I want you to notice here. As we're going to get into this message, we're going to camp out in John chapter 11. But before we do that, let's go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, this is the prayer of Jesus for himself, for his disciples, and for the church. It says these words, verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the what? The hour is what? The hour is come. Then what's that next word? Glorify thy son, that thy, that thy son also may what? Glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And then notice what Christ goes on to say. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I want you to notice that in Isaiah, it's future tense. In, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it's present or, or even past tense because John said we beheld his glory. And here Jesus says, glorify me now with the glory that I shared with you before the world was. <laughs> and then notice verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. So what I wanted to share with you, is, first of all, before we get into John chapter 11, is that the glory of God, which is his character, by the way, what does it say in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 regarding God? That God is what, everybody? Love. That God is love. 
God is love. That is his character. That is the essence of, God is the essence of love. He is the epitome of love. He is the definition of love. He is love. And so, fa family, what I want to share with you is that we're going to see the glory of God. And even in the case of Lazarus, that's why Jesus is going to make that statement in which we're going to turn to right now. In John chapter 11, if you will go there, John chapter 11, and what we find in the Gospel of John is you have the seven signs of Jesus, right? You have the seven miracles of Jesus, the seven signs of Jesus. The, the crowning one being what we find in, Act, in uh, John chapter 11 is the resurrection of Lazarus from the grave. And check this out. It's going to be that miracle, that crowning miracle of the seven, that is actually going to be the trigger point that would lead Christ to the cross. This would be the one that would take, that would take the, the council over. In other words, this would be the, the straw that would break the camel's back. It would be this crowning miracle that should have been the, great, the greatest manifestation and the greatest demonstration and the greatest revelation that Jesus Christ is indeed who he claims to be. That he, is, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, that he is the divine son of God. This crowning act, this crowning miracle would be the one that would actually lead to his own death. So the death of Lazarus and the, and the raising of Lazarus would lead to the death of Jesus Christ. Huh. But it would, be, it would reveal the glory of God. Would you say amen? It would be the greatest demonstration of the glory of God. That's the reason why Jesus is praying in John 17 that the hour is come. What hour is that? The hour for Jesus to lay down his life and to reveal and to give us the greatest demonstration of the glory of God. Because there is no greater demonstration of the love of God than the cross of Jesus Christ. <laughs> but let's look, at, let's look at John chapter 11. And so what we have here in John chapter 11, and please go with me to verse 45. John chapter 11, verse 45. I want to I begin there with this encounter. We're talking about Jesus and his encounter with a dead man. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. So what we, what we discover here is that because of the miracles of Christ, especially this one of, laz of, of raising Lazarus from the dead, this is why they finally were now ready to take action against Jesus and to put him to death. Please understand this, that there were other times in which there, there were several attempts on the life of Jesus. Was there not? Wasn't there a time where they tried to stone him? Wasn't there another time where they tried to push him off a, off a, off a cliff? Yeah. yeah. And each time, each time Jesus managed to what? To get out of that situation. He was like, he was like dodging and, and ducking and weaving and avoiding their pitfalls and their traps. Christ managed to escape these, uh, these times in which they were trying to take his life. Why? Because his hour had not yet come, and that would not be the way in which Jesus would die. Although the devil was trying with all the, the fury of hell and all of his power to take out Christ some other way, we know that according to the Bible, Jesus had to die on a cross. <laughs> Let me, let, me, let me give you another passage of scripture that proves this and just hold your thumb there. Notice what it says in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, many, many of us in here know it very well, but we need to look into the word of God. Would you say amen? Philippians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 
and verse 5. Notice what the Word of God says here regarding Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. And this is so powerful. I love, I love, I love what it says here. Um, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in who? In Christ Jesus, right? In Christ Jesus. It says, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no what, everybody? No reputation. And took upon him the, so the, the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he did what? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the what? Even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the what? To the glory of God the Father. Would you say amen? amen? Again, it's about the glory of God. And so what we have here is Jesus was, would be obedient to the death of the cross. And I'm going to get into a little bit more of that tomorrow night when I'm talking about Jesus and the thief when we close out our series. But go back with me to John chapter 11. So Jesus, Jesus was obedient even to the death on the cross. Now, Going back to John chapter 11, let's look at this. Let's look at this story. Let's look at this encounter and see what we can glean from this encounter that Jesus has with a dead man. Because what, what has that to do with any one of us? How does that apply to us? I want you to notice what it says in John chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Now there was a, cer there was, now a certain man was sick. A certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is what? Is sick. Now I've got slides for the next one. It says that when Jesus heard that, he said, now check this out. He said that this sickness, this sickness is not unto what? Is not unto death, but for the what? But for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And I, and, I, and I love that because Jesus is saying, listen, this sickness is not unto death, but it is, for, it is for the glory of God and that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And how is he going to be glorified? Through the death of Lazarus. How is he going to be glorified by what Lazarus is going through? Because I want to share, family, that it is not about Lazarus. It is more about Christ and how he's going to be glorified in this entire encounter and what's going to take place. And I just mentioned it to you. I just laid out for you that the glory of God is his willingness, not only because he's love, but he's also a self-sacrificing, self-renouncing. He's also a self-renouncing God. In other words, it is his love that is so unselfish, so is not self-centered. It's not focusing upon himself. And so what we see at the cross is the greatest demonstration of that sacrifice or that selflessness and that, and that self-renouncing, um, you know, self-sacrificing love that Jesus has. That's how it's going to be glorified because it's going to lead to his own death. Christ not only will call forth the, the, the dead from the grave, but he himself is willing to take on death. I'm so thankful that, listen, family, I'm thankful that Jesus is not only willing to encounter death, but Jesus is also willing to take on death and conquer death because no one in the human family can conquer death or the grave. Isn't that right? There's not one single human being that can conquer the grave, that can conquer death. But praise be to God that Jesus came in the flesh and according to Romans chapter 8, verse 3, conquered sin in the flesh, conquered death in our flesh. Would somebody say amen? amen. That's the gospel. And so what's happening here, and, and notice what else it goes on to say. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loved this family. You know, we read in a place where it talks about how Christ felt like in the home of this, of this family, right? Like he can just basically unwind. 
he found he found a place where you know he was uh, accepted and loved, and he was uh, you know he was he was respected. I mean, think about it. Everywhere he went, you had the Pharisees or the Sadducees, or you had the Herodians, and you had all of these different people that were constantly trying to engage him and debate with him and and cause trouble. While here in this home, the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus in Bethany, he found a place where he can be, you know, loved and respected and accepted. The question I want to ask you, and by the way, Christ wants to enter into all of our homes. Christ wants to enter into all of our families. Christ wants to enter into all of the spaces that we find ourselves in. Why? Because Christ brings joy and peace and love, and he brings all these things that we so desperately need. Family, I want to tell you that Christ is the key and the answer to all of the problems that we face, not just individually, but in our homes and in our churches and in our communities. Would you say amen? Are we willing to invite him in? Well, does Christ find a a, a nice landing spot, if you will, in in our homes? I mean, is is Christ, you know, welcomed in our homes? It says there that he loved this family. And by the way, he loves each and every one of us. Isn't that right? He loves us. And then it goes on to say, when he heard that he was sick, now, this, this is like, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. I don't know, man, we, we, we have doctors in the house. I mean, how would, how would you respond to that if, if this is a dear friend of yours, Dr. Chan? This is somebody, yeah, this is somebody that you love. What, what was that, Doc? Yeah, you would probably go immediately, right? I mean, but, but Jesus, it just seems as if while the messenger comes and gives him the message that, dear friend, the one that you love is sick. It's as, it's as, it's, it's as if Jesus, you know, just like he did earlier today with the, the woman that came, the desperate woman that came to him, it's, a, it's as if, you know, he doesn't pay attention or he doesn't hear the message or he, like, turns away from it. For some reason, it seems like he ignores it, right? But listen, family. Again, what Christ is saying, though, is that this sickness is not unto death. It is for the glory of God and that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And by the way, here's something else. Oftentimes, we, as human beings, we get impatient. I know you can ask my daughter how impatient I am. Um, And and I'm I'm not a very patient person, which is why I need Jesus constantly. Would you say amen? I'm not patient when I'm driving on the road, and I know some of you may be. Uh, I, I, I get very impatient. Um, sometimes the Lord has to help me with my patience, you know, at, at the house because I have expectations and I, I want certain things done. And, um, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. God's timing is always perfect timing. We may, we may think that God should come, when, you know, like at a certain time, and, and we're saying, Lord, where are you? You know, come on, man, I need you. I'm, in, I'm so desperate. I'm in this situation. I'm in this circumstance. I find myself struggling. I find myself, man, I'm, I'm, I'm drowning, and, and, and all of this stuff is happening. Lord, where are you? Can I tell you, family, that God is always going to be there, and he will show up right on time. Amen? It may not be the time that we always want him to, but he will show up, and it will be right on time. It's amazing how, um, you know, when, when, and just imagine what Mary and Martha must be thinking when the messenger gets back and the messenger comes back and Jesus is not with that person. Now, let me continue on. It says here um, that he stayed where he was for two more days. Then after this, Jesus said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Let me continue on. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is the light is not in him, okay? And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go back to I'm gonna keep it there. But what is Jesus saying here? Why all of a sudden now Jesus 
after two days, he says, okay, we're going to go up to Judea. And his disciples are, 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 are afraid for him because they just try to stone him there. They just, try to, they just try to take Christ's life, right? They try to stone him there. But what is Jesus' response to that? Jesus says that there are what? There are 12 hours in a day. And as long as there are 12 hours in a day, as long as it is still light, there, it is time to what? To work. It is time to work. You know, um, in, in December of 2020, um, my wife and I got COVID. And it was, it was I'm going to tell you, it was, it, was a, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. We were laid out. We were laid out for a couple of weeks. I mean, you know, uh, and, and thank God, thank God, our daughter Lala and our two little ones, they didn't get it. And so, but I want to tell you that, I want to tell you that, man, it hit us hard. It hit me and my wife hard. And, and, and um, it, there, were days where, there were days where you just felt like, man, you couldn't breathe. Like, uh, uh, man, you're, you're, you're gasping for air. Your, your chest feels like it's about to explode. Your head feels like it's about to explode. Anyone in the room know what I'm talking about? Anybody else here been through that? So, man, there I was laid up. And I thought to myself, and I was hearing all these reports. You know how it is. You know, you, think, you hear about people that are dying from, from this thing. And, um, and all of a sudden, I just thought to myself, man, Lord, is this, man, where is this going? I need your healing. Where are you at, God? Please, Jesus, heal me. And, man, I was going through it, and I praise God that God did get us through it. He healed us. And I, that's why I believe in the promise in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 14, where it says, Heal me, Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Would you say amen? And so, family, I want to share with you that God wants to bring healing, but the greater, the greater healing that must take place is that if for some reason, if for whatever reason God decides not to heal us physically, please understand that the greatest healing to ever take place is the healing of the sin-sick soul from sin, and that our salvation is secure in Jesus. And even if we were to take our rest, as long as our lives are secure in Jesus and hid with Christ in God, we have nothing to fear because when Jesus comes again, we will come up in the first resurrection. Can I tell you that it is a win-win situation for the Christian that believes in Jesus? What do you mean, Pastor, win-win? Well, first of all, God can raise you up from that sickbed if he decides to. Would you say amen? Oh, yeah, you're going, to have, you're going to have terminal cancer. You're going to be dealing with all kinds of issues and sicknesses and disease. You're going, to be, you're going to be laid out. But I got news for you. God is still that healing God. God is still that prayer hearing, prayer answering, miracle working God. My Bible tells me in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God has not changed. He is still in the business of performing miracles. And family, I want to share with you that if God chooses and decides, here's why it's a win-win situation. Again, God can raise you up from your sickbed. God can restore your health 100%. But if he decides and chooses not to, guess what? If you fall asleep in Christ Jesus, praise be to God, you're going to come up in the first resurrection. How's that a lose? How, how, how is there any loss in that? Either God is going to heal you and perform that miracle, or he's going to allow you to take your rest and raise you up in the first resurrection. That's win-win. Would you say amen? That's win-win. And by the way, when he says that there are 12 hours in the day, and while it is yet day, it is time to work. Jesus rose me up from my sickbed and said, nah, son, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not going to, you're not going out like that. I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let you off that easy. He said, there's still more work to do. So here, let me, let me raise you up from your sick bed, you and your wife. Let me, let me feel, let me, let me restore your health. Let me fill you with my spirit because now I'm going to take you to even more places to share and spread the gospel. He says there are still 12 hours in a day. Family, I want to share with you that while it is yet day, while God has given to each and every one of us breath and life, we are to labor and, and work for the master to the going down of the sun. 
The sun has not set on any one of us. The fact that we are in this room, still alive and breathing, that God has given us an opportunity, more of an opportunity to share the gospel. And so, the Bible says here that Jesus said to her, and before I get there, I just want to, I just want to, Read something else in, in, in John chapter 11. And so, family, the question is, are we, making, are we taking advantage and making full use of the time that God has given us to work into labor, to pray, to reach out to precious souls in need of the good news? Precious souls that are not only sick, but dying. I want you to notice what it says in John chapter 11, verse 11. These things said he, and after he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may do what? Awake him out of sleep. And then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleeps, he shall do well. Lord, if he sleeps, he shall do well. Oh, I love these medical missionaries. Don't you? These medical missionaries are, are, are sharing with, with, with Jesus that, you know, as long as he gets some rest, he's going to be fine, Lord. He'll be fine. And, 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 and Jesus says, how be it? Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is what, everybody? Is dead. Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And then, of course, you have what Thomas says there. And he says, let's just go up there. Let's just go and die with him. <laughs> <laughs> Man, come on. Hey, fellas, let's just go. Let's just go and die with Jesus. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave how many days? He had been there four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha... Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at which day? The last day. And so Martha understood the doctrine of the resurrection and yet still failed to see that the very one in verse 25, which we have on the screen, Jesus said to her, I am the what? Resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall what, everybody? He shall live. Would you say amen? He shall live. And Jesus is the resurrection of the life. That's quite a claim. By the way, you'd be hard-pressed. You'd be hard-pressed to find any other person that makes this claim. Go ahead and look at all the other major religions and other people. Now, some have a Messiah complex. And they'll come and say, you know, that I am Jesus or I am the Lord or, you know, follow me. But I want to tell you that there, you'll be hard-pressed to find any other person who makes this claim that they are the resurrection and the life. Jesus is saying here, and again, we have those two Greek words that speak of life, right? We have bios, from which we derive the word biology, and that speaks to all of us because what it means, bios means, is that we receive life from another source. We don't have life within ourselves. We get that life from another source. Now, the second Greek word for life is zoe. 
Zoe is where I believe where the servant of the Lord writes that in Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. Would you say amen? amen? In other words, he doesn't have his life from another source. He is the source of life. God is the source of life. He is not bios. He is Zoe. And so, family, what I want to share with you is this, is that Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Amen. You see, we started off this journey. We started off this journey, this encounters with Jesus, and we looked at all these different encounters. And by the way, I'm only doing eight. I share with Pastor that I have 20 or actually more than 20 in this series of encounters with Jesus. I mean, I haven't even touched on Zacchaeus. No, I'm not Zacchaeus. Okay? I'm small in stature like Zacchaeus, but I'm not Zacchaeus. I am not that man. Would you say amen? amen. But I praise God for Zacchaeus. And by the way, you'll discover that the Bible says in Luke chapter 19 that he was the chief of the tax collectors. I don't know how many of you have ever looked at that little, that little detail. He's not just a tax collector. He's the chief of tax collectors. And yet Jesus went to his house. Oh, you guys didn't catch that. You see, because the Apostle Paul says, for this reason Jesus came into the world, to save sinners of whom I am what? Chief. Catch the connection? Not only was he a tax collector, but he was the chief tax collector. Amen. I didn't touch about the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. Darius and his 12-year-old daughter who was laying at the point of death when, when he came to get Jesus. I haven't even touched on the widow of Nain and her son. There are so many, and Bartimaeus, and so many other encounters. But here's the point. From the time that we started this encounters with Jesus, we have discovered that each one speaks to a human condition and that there's nothing that any one of us as human beings can do to change our condition unless we have the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit present to help us in our condition. Why? Because we don't have it within us to change ourselves. We can't change our heart. We can't change our mind. We can't do any of that unless we have and are confronted with the goodness and the mercy of God. Would you say amen? amen. We can't even repent. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Amen. When we have an encounter with how good God is, that's what leads us to repentance. Amen. I wonder why the book Steps to Christ begins with the chapter, God's Love for Man. Because when we are encountered, when we encounter the love of God, then we're going to recognize the sinner's need of Christ. And then the steps from there continue on. It, it, it's, it's in its correct order. Think about it. John the Baptist in a dungeon had doubts, had questions, and even sent his disciples, to ask Jesus, are you the one that, are you the one that we should expect? Or, or are you the one to come? Or is there another one that we should expect? Jesus said, go and tell John what you see and hear. Case closed. John was ready now to take his rest. How about, how about the insider? Nicodemus was caught up in his what? In his own self-righteousness and holier-than-thou attitude. Could he save himself from that? No. No. As far as he was concerned, as far as he was concerned, he had it all together. But, was, but, 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 what really, but, what, but what really but what really caught him by surprise and shocked him is when Jesus looked at this, at this well-learned, educated, affluent, wealthy um, leader, civic and religious leader in Israel, he said, you must be born again. How about the outsider, the woman at the well? Could she change her situation and her circumstances without the help of the living water? No. What about the demoniac? 
Could the demoniac free himself from that legion of demons? No. Uh-uh. No way, no how. No way. How about the rich young ruler who thought that he could save himself with his checkbox religion? Now, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus told him what to do. And he was not, he, the Bible says that he sadly went away. And then Jesus said, Jesus said that with men, this is impossible. Man cannot save himself. It is an impossibility. But praise be to God, it says that with God, how many things are possible? All things. Even saving the worst of sinners. This morning... What do, we, what do we look at? The desperate woman. Question, could that woman have helped herself and saved her daughter? No. Why do you think she came to Jesus? So what I'm sharing with you is that we see in each of these encounters the reality of the human condition and God's, God's answer, his solution, and his remedy to the human condition and the sin problem. Aren't you thankful that Jesus provides himself as the remedy for the sin problem? Amen? Amen. Yes, he does. And now it's gotten to, it's even, it's even worse in this case. Because Jesus says that I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall what? He shall live. I think one of, the, one of the, brother Mel John, one of the saddest things that I, not sad, but I wish, I wish we would really pay more, more attention to it and get more excited about it. And that is when, Christ, when, people, when people respond to Christ and they give their life to Jesus and they are, they are baptized, that is a resurrection. That is, that, that's people coming back to life. Would you say amen? That, that's what's happening. Let me, let me continue on. So Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever, whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He who, he who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Notice what she said. She said unto him, Lord, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had, said, when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master has come and calleth for her. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her, comforted comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily and went out following her saying she goes unto the grave to weep there then when Mary was coming to Jesus where Jesus was and saw him she fell down at his feet saying unto him Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died then Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her he groaned in the spirit and was troubled man I wish I could unpack more of this stuff but we don't for the sake of time and said where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. What does verse 35 say? What did Jesus do? It says, Jesus what? Wept. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, coming to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And then notice Martha. She says, um, the sister of, of Lazarus said, uh, Lord, by this time, he smells because he is decomposing, and he has been dead for four days. Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou should see the what? The glory of God. 
Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always because of the people which stand by. I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And then we know the, the powerful words, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, what? Come forth. <laughs> oh, man. Lazarus, come forth. And when, he, and when he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin, Jesus said unto them, unto them Loose him and let him what? And let him go. Did you say amen? amen? Now, you know, evangelists like to use this all the time about that if Jesus Christ had just said, you know, come forth from the grave, it said that all the graves would have popped open. Because if, you know, John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, it tells us that, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his what? Will hear his voice and what? And come forth. Those, you know, there will be those who will come forth to the resurrection of what? Of life and those who will come forth to the resurrection of damnation. So the beautiful thing about that is that Jesus knows each and every one of us by name. <laughs> Would you say amen? He knows us by name. He knows us personally. He knows, he knows us. He has an intimate knowledge of who we are. So now how does this apply to us, Pastor? Where, where, where are you getting at with this? Well, glad you asked. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, Verses 1 through 6. Notice what it says. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. <laughs> Woo, look at the human condition. Mm, mm, mm. Have you ever seen a man or a woman resurrect themselves from the grave? Does anyone have that power to do it? That's right, Doc. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. It says, and you, you, he made what? He made alive. He quickened. He made alive who were what? Dead in what? Trespasses and sins. Question, how many is that? Is that all of us? Is that the whole human race that's depicted up there, that's, that's mentioned up there? That you, who, who were made alive, were dead in your trespasses and sins? And, 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 and just thinking back, going back to, again, the, the impossibility of us changing our, our hearts and our minds... Even the most gifted, the most talented, the most intelligent heart surgeon in all of the world is incapable, unable to perform their own heart surgery. They need somebody else to do that procedure. They can't, they can't perform that on themselves. No wonder why David says in Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12, he says, create in me, what kind of a heart? A clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Would you say amen? amen? Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. The book of Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27 says that I will take away your stony heart and give you what kind of a heart? A heart of what? Flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh, and then you will be able to walk in my statutes, and obey my ways. And, fi and family, I want to share with you that the only one, the only one that can change our hearts and to change our minds if we give him the permission to do so and we invite him to do so is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Would you say amen? Our condition is this. And you he made alive who are dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. That's one according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, that's two, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves 
in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. That's three. What leads us into this condition of spiritual death, of death? What leads it? First of all, Paul says, listen, there are three that we contend with or that we deal with. And by the way, we're no match for any one of them. We're no match for any one of them. Guess what, family? We're no match for the world. The allurements and the attractions of the world are too strong for us, especially when, especially when we have a nature that gravitates, that is bent, that, that, that is crooked, that goes towards evil and sin. There's no way the, gravi the, the gravitational pull of the world to our nature is one where we just naturally gravitate to the world and its allurements. But praise be to God, Jesus has conquered the world. No wonder why it says over there in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says that we can become partakers of the divine nature. <laughs> Man, aren't you thankful for that promise? It says coming out of this corruptible world and, and dealing with all of this stuff, it says that we can become partakers of the divine nature. We can be connected to Christ. Now, for those who get past the world, and you pat yourself on the back. You still got to contend with the prince of the power of the air. And I, I got to say, unless you guys can tell me any differently, we are no match for the devil. But I got news for you. The devil is no match for Jesus. Amen? He conquered that old rascal, that one that continues to harass and to, and to buffet and to attack and to tempt each and every one of us. But praise be to God that Jesus has conquered the devil. Where Adam fell, Jesus, the second Adam, conquered. Then if you get past that one, Paul says that you still got to deal with the flesh, <laughs> self. And you know, the servant of the Lord says that the greatest battle that we face is the battle with who? With self. Do I have a witness in here about that? Huh? Anybody, anybody in here been able to beat yourself up? Huh? John, <laughs> don't, don't say it, John. <laughs> I'd like to. Sometimes I'd like to, to, to punch that guy in the mirror. <laughs> right? Like, man, you know, like, you know, do, do, a, do a Manny Pacquiao, you know, and, you know, just like, man, unload on him. But I, I discover that, man, he hits me back. I can't handle self. That's the, by the way, that's the greatest enemy that we face on a daily basis is self. Why? Because we love to do it our way. And we want to have our way. The toughest thing for us as human beings to do is what's found over there in the, the book of James, chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, where it says, submit ye therefore to God. <laughs> oh, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you, right? But how can that happen if we submit to who? Submit to God. But guess what? Oftentimes, more than, more than often, we don't want to submit to God. And we try to take on the devil ourselves and end up getting whipped. So guess what? We're no match for the world. We're no match for the devil. And we're no match for self. But I'm thankful that Jesus has conquered the world. He's conquered the devil. And he's conquered self. Would you say amen? amen. And we can have that same victory. Think about it. Think about it. We're, we're, we're just about done here, family. We're just about done. I want to, I want you to go with me finally to Ephesians 2, where we, where we were just looking at. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping this up. And, and so we, we can probably wonder, we probably were sitting there wondering, man, what is it?
that we have to do with a dead man. And why is that encounter so important? Well, because we too were dead in trespasses and sins. And our only hope of a resurrection is Jesus Christ. Uh, think of, look, look, look at this. Look at this. In Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Man, I get so excited when I read this part of it. And by the way, um, scholars and theologians um, look at Ephesians chapter 2 as the grace chapter. But here's, here's the point that I want to I bring up. We just read, right? We just read. Um, right there in Ephesians chapter 2. Ooh, that's right there on the screen. Man, I thought I, I thought I had missed it. What is the first two words? Say it again. Come on, church, which conviction? But God. But who? But God. You see, because our condition, which was dead, because we, the world, Satan, and self, and the lust of the flesh. We were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. Well, what then changed? What helped us in our, in our condition? But God. Would you say amen? Man, I love it. I love, I love it when, when it seems like, man, it, it, it's hopeless. We're helpless. There's nothing that we can do. And then it says in verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy and because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Would you say amen? Glory to God. And I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it again. Verses 8 through 10. That phrase, for you are saved by grace, is repeated. Verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 2 says, for by grace. For by what, Adventist? For by what? Grace. For by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved. And not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. It is the what? The gift of God. Question, can we earn a gift? Can we, I mean, is there anything that we can do to earn and to buy our way to heaven? Is there anything that we can do to earn and buy salvation? No. It is a gift. And because I'm speaking to, I'm sharing with my, my, my the majority here, I don't know, if there's anybody in the room who's not Adventist, but because I'm sharing with my Adventist family, I want to share with you that let this, let this truth, let this truth, this beautiful truth, this powerful truth, let it seep in. Why? Because there are so many within our church who are still held in bondage because they believe somehow, some way, that it is through their works and their good deeds that they are going to get to the kingdom. My Bible tells me that's not the case. It says, for by grace you have been saved. Through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And by the way, both grace and faith in that verse are gifts from God. Because even the faith that we have, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 3 or 4, it says that God has given to every man a measure of faith. So even the faith that we have comes from God to receive the precious gift of grace that changes and transforms us. Would you say amen? amen. He goes on to say in verse 9, not of works, not of what? Not of works, lest any man should what? Should boast. So guess what? When we all get to glory, when we all get to the kingdom, there's not going to be one person in this room who's going to be able to boast and brag that they got to the kingdom because of something you've done, because of something I've done. No, we are all going to be praising God and kneeling before Jesus and casting down our crowns at his feet, praising him for saving us by his grace. Now, one person going to be able to boast or brag. How did you get here? <laughs> uh, you know. Man. Showing up to church every Sabbath. That good old vegan diet I was on. 
That's why I'm here. And Jesus will be like, listen, there's not one person that's going to get to glory that's going to be able to take any credit for what God has done. Now, again, I'm not, listen, I'm not, I'm not diminishing. I'm not saying that those things don't matter. But we need to put it in its proper perspective and proper place. Now, for the Adventists who are just clamoring for, okay, I hear the grace part. I hear the faith part. I hear that it's a gift. I hear that we can't boast about it. But come on, there's got to be something in there that I got, that I'm doing that enables me to get to the kingdom. No, no, no. Because, listen, and I'm not saying it. Read it for yourself in the Bible. The Bible is saying it. Not Nehemiah. The Bible is saying it. Now, where does works come in? Where does the fruit come in? Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Who? His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Would somebody say amen? Amen. Ah, Paul has the formula. You see, we flipped it. We want a performance-based Christianity that dictates the relationship. When it should be the relationship-based Christianity that determines the performance. Did you guys did you guys catch that? Let me ask you guys a question. Did Nicodemus and the rich young ruler have a performance-based Christianity, or I should say religion? Yeah. And Christ said, you know what? That's not going to cut it. That's not going to work. That's why it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, and I'm, I'm closing it, then I'm going to make an appeal. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, what does it say? For it is God. It is who? It is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good, what? Pleasure. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, what does it say? He that hath begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it to the day of who? Jesus Christ. I have seen some of the greatest resurrections take place. And by the way, you ought to read Romans chapter 6. It talks about baptism. It talks about he that is, I believe it's verse 7. It says that he that is dead is freed from sin. <laughs> you know, the, the, the application can be made that, you know, if we, had, um, if we had a funeral service up here tonight and there was a, you know, a loved one up here that we were, you know, doing the service for, um, I mean, how many... How, how, would that person be able to hear, if you were angry with that person, would they be able to hear you, like, cursing them out or, or and, and God forbid, don't ever do this at a funeral. Don't ever go up to a dead person and slap them. Because, let, let, me, let me ask you something. How much of a response are you going to get? None. Why? Because they're what? Because they're dead. And the application can be made that if we, if we the flesh is dead, if, if, if self is dead, and we, are, and we are constantly submitted and surrendered to the Holy Spirit, guess what? When, 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 when the devil comes our way and when people come our way, we are not going to respond in the flesh. But we are going to respond according to the what? Spirit. Because the flesh should be what? Dead. And we should be alive and walking in the what? Spirit. Well, I was so thankful that I had my daughter Lala around me. There are times when daddy loses his mind and gets out of hand, and she has to remind me. <laughs> uh, am I the only person in the room that, uh, you know? I remember one time, uh, you know, I held, I held, I think I shared this here. I held the door open. We were at um, Highline Community College and, you know, looking at a couple of classes and things like that. And um, my queen and my princess were getting ready to walk out the door, so I hold the door open for them. And this young guy just bolts right past them. Like, he just cuts them off. Like, walks right in front of them, 
cuts them off, and comes out the door. And as he's coming out the door, he doesn't even say thank you. And I said, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. He turns around and he goes, thanks, man. And my daughter is standing there like, no, you didn't, Dad. You, she said, that's the reason why I don't like going anywhere with you sometimes. <laughs> I remember I took her to the academy to register her for class. We were at Sunset Lake, New Life Church. Had the most powerful weekend, like one of the most powerful weekends the Holy Spirit fell. Man, um, there were like over 20, almost 30 kids who were baptized on that weekend. I have to take her to, to Auburn Academy on Sunday morning. When we got to miss breakfast. We're going to miss the devotional. We're going to miss all this stuff. So I'm already in a bad mood. And I drive and I take her, I take her over there and I said, okay, Lala, we're going to go in. You just go and get your stuff for your classes, register, and we're out. We're going right back to camp. Well, she goes in there, right, and we're walking around the hallways, and she's over there just chatting with her friends, chatting with everybody, taking her sweet time. And I said, Lala, come on. We got to get out of here. She said, I brought the wrong parent. <laughs> and she says it out loud where everybody in the hall can hear her. She said, man, I brought the wrong parent. I should have asked mom to come and bring me. And I'm standing there like, ooh, oof. You, hmm. One time I, I, I almost got into uh, an altercation um, in a parking lot because, you know, some guys hit my car. And, um, you know, and that old, that old man just came back up. I thought he was dead, but he came back up. <laughs> Lala was in the back seat. And my little, my little son. We have another, we have a daughter too. So Lala's 16, Adonijah's now four, Charity's three. They hit my car, and instead of listening to the Holy Spirit who was saying, keep driving, give it to me, keep driving, I put the car in reverse, and there were three of them, and I said, you guys got a problem? And they said, Yes, we do. I said, okay. Put the car in park. <laughs> Jumped out. Went right up to them. And I'm just, listen, I'm being real here. So I, I went up to them, and they're looking down at me. These guys are pretty tall. And I tell them, I said, you know what? I said, I'm about to mop this, mark, uh, this parking lot up with all three of you. And I, said, and, I said, and I said to them, I said, go ahead. I want one of you guys, first of all, to take the first swing so that when this goes down, you can't call the police on me and say that I started this and that it was self-defense. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I want you to take the first swing so that I can tell them that it was first defense, I mean self-defense. So as, I'm, getting re as I'm, 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 right up, I'm right up on their chin, I'm like, let's go. What are you waiting for, right? Next thing you know, my daughter is crying in the car from the back seat of the car. And she says, Dad, what are you doing? Get in the car. And, 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 and I can, then I can hear my son crying. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Hold up. What am I doing? And I back away. And I just look at them and I'm like, you know, I do this. I get in the car. Lala's still she's, still, she's still crying. She grabs my Bible next to her in the back seat. And she puts it on the armrest and says, I want to remind you who you are, Dad. You're not that man that you once were. You belong to God. I broke, man, what, what am I going to say? That's why, listen, that's why I'm saying, regardless of whether or not you're a pastor, an evangelist, or a member of the church, the bottom line is this. All of us need Jesus daily. 
And why do we get so surprised and shocked when people act out the natural dictates and impulses of the natural heart when you're outside of Christ and outside of the spirit? It should be more shocking and surprised that any one of us do anything good. <laughs> right? That's what, I can't believe so-and-so did that. What do you mean you can't believe it? If they're, not, if they're acting out the natural inclinations and impulses of the natural heart apart from Christ, they're doing only what comes naturally. Which, why, which is why we need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to help us to overcome. Would you say amen? amen. That's the only way it's going to be done. So I'm done.